All right, so uh, in this section, we're going to continue our exploration of rotational motion by talking about wheels. Wheels um, uh, are another of the six canonical, like, simple machines. We've already met two, the ramp and the lever, um, that exploit kind of the way the laws of motion work to let us manipulate forces and do equivalent amounts of work, but, you know, trade off big and small forces uh, over longer and shorter distances, as we've talked about in the previous section. Now, one of the main things, actually, that wheels help us overcome um, is friction. Wheels help us uh, reduce the friction that objects experience as they move or slide over other uh, surfaces. Okay. Uh, so before we really get into wheels, I need to say a little bit more about uh, this idea of friction that we've been uh, kind of talking about lately. Friction. Um, so we know that uh, from Newton's laws of motion, if we uh, have an object that's experiencing a net force, that object will accelerate. So why is it that we can exert a force on a heavy object sitting on the ground um, and not observe any, uh, any resulting motion, right? It must be because that object is experiencing other forces that are opposing your efforts to push it around. So if I've got, you know, our canonical block, maybe it's actually a bookcase, you never know. Uh, and you're trying to push it, uh, force of some push, if you don't see this uh, bookcase accelerating, it must be that there's another force at play uh, resisting the object's motion. Well, we already know that there's a force due to gravity pushing it down. We know that there's a normal force or a support force from the ground pushing the object uh, back up, support force. And there has to be something balancing out this force as well. Uh, and what that force is, is uh, as I'm sure you've uh, you've guessed, it's the force of friction, right? So um, there's an interaction between the object and the surface that's exerting a force in the direction that opposes any motion of this object. Okay. So if I was pushing from the other side, uh, you know, if instead I had someone standing over here and they were pushing this way, friction would work uh, to oppose it. Right. It would point in the opposite direction. So really, if any two surfaces, whether that's an object sitting on the ground or my two hands pressed together, you know, any two surfaces um, are brought into contact and are moving relative to each other, friction is a force that's going to act on both objects in a direction that will tend to bring those two surfaces uh, to the same velocity. So when I say if they're in relative motion, that means that if I imagine going to a frame of reference where one of them is standing still, uh, the other one is moving at some velocity. Uh, you might be wondering, uh, just as a kind of offhand remark, you know, if I have a flat bookcase uh, sitting on flat ground, how is it that those two surfaces are able to exert a force horizontally? You know, I have a perfectly flat pair of surfaces aligned parallel in the vertical direction. How can they exert forces horizontally? It turns out to come from actually the microsco microscopic structure of um, what those surfaces look like. Uh, I found a random video. Um, of what sandpaper looks like under a microscope, right? So we have a sense of sandpaper as being, okay, it's a surface so rough we can kind of visually see uh, that it's rough. Um, but if you look on kind of finer and finer microscopic scales, you see that that roughness um, is kind of more and more intricate, even as you zoom in on exceedingly small parts of the surface, right? Uh, exceedingly small parts. And so even as you go down to like the very microscopic, basically the atomic or molecular scale even apparently flat surfaces are actually microscopically very rough. And the amount of friction they're able to kind of supply uh, comes from that microscopic roughness. You've got two surfaces with all of these teeny tiny valleys and crevices that interlock and get in the way um, and oppose motion uh, in the direction transverse to the, to the surface. Um, Remarkably, we know kind of the general principles of how friction works, but if you want a microscopic, like theoretical understanding of if I have this material, um, exactly what types, what are the magnitudes of friction that I will predict, this is actually still at the forefront of a lot of modern research. We've got really good engineering in our capacity to control friction, but we still don't have a complete theoretical understanding. And so I like this. It's another example of one of those kind of very trivial questions. Why do I need to push harder on an object uh, over some surfaces to get it to move? Um, that already brings you to kind of the edge of current scientific research. Okay. Um, based on our description of work and the conservation of energy, you might also be wondering, you know, I know that if I'm exerting a force uh, on this block, if I'm exerting a force and I move the block from here, you know, 
over to here, so I exert a force and the block moves some distance, I know that I've done work, right? And I know that energy is conserved. So where did all of that energy go, right? Um, one way, one place it could have gone would be into kinetic energy. So if I was on ice and I did work, I might see that at the end of the work I've done, uh, the block was still moving at some velocity. And we saw earlier that the kinetic energy of a translating object, which was like one half mv squared, you know, maybe my work went into the velocity. But if I'm pushing, you know, this bookcase around on flat ground, we know that as soon as I stop pushing, uh, the bookcase is going to stop moving. So where did all of that energy go? Um, you probably already have the sense of this. It goes into thermal energy. You know, just as when you take your hands and you rub them together and you feel uh, excess heat, um, you know, thermal energy is is a type of energy. And uh, in the case of sliding friction, in the case of friction, uh, it's where the work we do typically goes. Some amount of the work we do also goes into like deforming the material at the very small scale, maybe breaking some of the chemical bonds that hold particular molecules in place, you know, snapping off small pieces or wearing off pieces of our surfaces, uh, things like this. Uh, okay, so what do we have? Friction, to kind of summarize, um, acts to oppose, uh, acts to uh, oppose the relative motion relative motion of two surfaces in contact. In contact. So if you bring any two surfaces together and you try to move them relative to each other, the force of friction will point in a direction uh, opposite the motion, so that it's trying to slow those, uh, slow that relative motion down and bring it to a, bring it to a stop. Uh, friction depends on three things, like how big is the frictional force? Uh, friction depends on uh, on three things. Um, it depends first on how tightly the surfaces are pressed together, how tightly the surfaces are pushed together. You probably have a sense of this if, you ever, if you've ever tried to move like an empty bookcase versus a full bookcase. You know that when the bookcase is empty, it's easier to push it around. So the force of friction opposing you must be less uh, than when you've filled it up with books or bricks, or whatever you keep uh, on your bookshelf. Um, so friction depends on how tightly these surfaces are pushed together. It depends, of course, on how slippery the surfaces are. How slippery uh, the surfaces are. You know, if you have two pieces of sandpaper and you rub them against each other, that's, there's going to be a lot of friction. If you flip the pieces of sandpaper over and rub just the plain you know, flat paper. Uh, there's going to be a lot less friction, and so again, I think that makes um, a lot of intuitive, uh, a lot of intuitive sense. Um, the third thing that friction depends on is whether the surfaces, whether the surfaces, are actually moving relative to each other, actually moving relative uh, to each other. Uh, this might be a little bit more unexpected, um, but maybe you've noticed that like how hard it feels like you have to push in order to like get an object moving actually feels a little bit different from how hard you have to push to keep it moving once it's already uh, traveling at some at some velocity across the surface. So this is because there are actually two types of friction. Uh, there are two types of friction. And these two types are called uh, static and dynamic, respectively. And dynamic friction is sometimes called sliding friction, um, which it is in the Bloomfield textbook. Um, so dynamic friction acts whenever two surfaces are actually sliding past each other. So acts when uh, surfaces are sliding, hence the name. And static friction is the thing that acts when um, surfaces are not in relative motion. Not in relative motion. Um, we sometimes talk about both of these types of frictions uh, at the same time uh, or in the same language by talking about um, 
uh, traction and traction forces. So traction is like the largest amount of a friction force that an object can obtain from a surface that it's in contact with at any given time. So if the object is moving, the traction is like the dynamic friction force, and when it's not moving, it's like the static friction force. Traction, of course, is neither good nor bad. Um, you know, the traction uh, from your bookcase is maybe obnoxious when you're trying to push it around, but it's helpful when you want your bookcase to stay still after you've put it, you know, wherever you want. And so then even if your floor is not perfectly level, um, the traction, you know, the static friction between your bookcase and the floor um, keeps your bookcase from moving around. So uh, this is a little exploration of what friction depends on and how it behaves. It always acts, again, it's a force that points in a direction that always opposes relative motion of two surfaces. So if I take my hands and I, you know, say have this hand steady and move this hand up, um, there's a force of friction acting on this hand as it moves up that's pushing downward. That means that I have to kind of push upward in order to keep my hand moving. Okay. And the magnitude of friction, because again, as a vector force, I have to tell you both its direction and its magnitude. The magnitude depends on things like how much am I pushing my hands together, how slippery are my hands, and are my hands not moving yet, or have they already started to move? Okay, so now that we've had this little kind of primer on the thing that wheels actually help us get around, how does rolling help? Um, so here's a, little, here's a little experiment that we can do. You know, if I take my fist and I push it into my palm, and then I just drag my fist across my hand, um, this is, you know, an example of my hands experiencing sliding or dynamic friction. And as I move my, my fist across my palm, um, I feel my skin heating up, right? Just as if I was doing this and I felt my skin heating up, right? So I'm kind of doing a lot of work and turning a lot of that work just into heat, okay? Um, on the other hand, I can push down just as hard, but instead of dragging my fist, I can just allow it to roll. And when I do this, uh, my fist still experiences static friction. Uh, and in fact, the static friction acting, you know, here and pointing, say, in this direction is like a torque and it causes my hand to rotate as I move it around my palm. Um, it still experiences static friction, but it's not experiencing sliding friction. And as a result, uh, I'm not losing all of that energy to, to heat. I'm not generating that thermal energy. Uh, and instead, the work that I'm doing is just going into translating uh, by rotations. Okay. And that's basically how rollers work. Uh, so I forgot to write down <laughs> the section title that we're about to do, but that's fine. Uh, you know, suppose I have, um, I have approximately flat ground and I have my heavy bookcase, uh, but now I'm gonna put little rollers underneath it, right? So as uh, somebody standing over here pushes this bookcase forward, um, the bookcase, so let me draw a few books. Um, the bookcase rolls, uh, you know, uh, rolls on top of these rollers. Um, rolls on top of the rollers. So these rollers uh, spin around and you know the bookcase moves forward. Every once in a while I have to pick up the back roller and put it in front of the neck in, in front of the bookcase so that I can roll onto it. But by doing this, I don't lose all of this energy to sliding friction. Just like my hand rolling across my fist, you know, these rollers are experiencing points of static friction where they're contacting the ground and the bookcase, and that static friction is providing a torque that's causing the rollers to roll, and the bookcase rolls happily on top, right? So uh, that's fantastic. Uh, this process of constantly taking a roller and putting it in front of a bookcase gets a little bit tiresome after a while. And so what do you do? You invent the wheel and axle. So you have a wheel, uh, you have like a cylinder uh, with an axle kind of going uh, going into the page in this example. Uh, maybe it looks like a bicycle wheel, and so there's spokes and everything. Um, and now maybe I make a cart out of a few wheels. I put my bookcase on top of the cart. And now, when this wheel is on the ground, again, there's static friction that acts right here on this wheel. Um, you know, if the whole thing is moving, uh, let's say, in this direction, velocity in this direction, uh, there's a force of static friction that's pointing this way. It's trying to oppose the motion of velocity force of friction, and because there's a pivot point here where this axle is, um, that means that there's an effective torque acting on this wheel, right? So there's a distance here, r, and so there's a torque on the wheel, which as we saw in the last section is r cross the force. r cross force, the torque causes the wheel to rotate, and, and off you go. So again, there's a, if you have a wheel that's not sliding or skidding around, 
there's only static friction uh, over here, and so you don't lose much energy to, uh, to frictional heating. Now, of course, if you have a static axle, then you do have a wheel that's like rubbing against the axle as it turns, so you, there's some uh, sliding friction there. You get some wear and tear, you lose some energy to heat, and so modern wheels, like in your car or on your bicycle, put little rollers uh, here. Uh, let me draw that slightly better, uh, and maybe let me erase a few things. So this is the wheel. Uh, the axle is here. And, uh, and there'll be little rollers, like ball bearings, um, as part of the wheel hub. So that rather than having sliding friction of the wheel spinning around the axle, you again only have static friction as these rollers roll. It's kind of a clever engineering trick, I suppose. Um, uh, that's fantastic. So uh, very good. So that is the um, that is the principle behind rollers, and then of course uh, wheels. The generalization of rollers. Um, since we've spent some time talking about rotational motion, oh, actually, before I go to this, um, let me just point out something that's kind of fun. You know, usually we think of wheels as being round, uh, but that actually doesn't have anything to do with um, the way wheels really work. The only reason that round wheels work is that, you know, or that round wheels are so ubiquitous is because round wheels um, make it easy to go over all sorts of different uh, shaped terrain. And if you have approximately flat ground, or even if it's sloped, but I mean the ground isn't like bumpy and jagged at the scale of the wheel, a round wheel works really well in almost all situations. Um, but as long as you have a wheel that conforms to the surface it's going over, your wheel can be whatever shape you like. Uh, so here is a video that I always found a little bit amusing of, uh, let's say, someone trying really hard to pedal with square wheels. And of course, on flat ground, uh, that's never going to work. Um, but if they're going not on flat ground, but over this kind of shape here, that conforms to the, the shape of the wheel, uh, in fact, a square wheel works perfectly fine, and it's exactly the same principle. You have only points of static friction, you don't have the wheels sliding across the ground, and the person can pedal nice and easily. Uh, I just thought that was kind of fun. Okay, but now, now that we've talked so much about wheels and rotations, uh, I want to go back to the idea of rotational motion and talk about kind of work and energy as it pertains not to objects translating through space, but rotating around. So rotational motion, work, uh, and energy. Rotational motion, work, and energy. And you'll remember that when we were in the last section and we were going through Newton's laws of rotational motion, we had kind of been very careful to set up our definitions of what position, angular velocity, angular acceleration, angular mass, uh, and torques were so that the equations we had that related all of these different things looked the same as in the translational case. And Newton's laws of motion read almost word for word identically. Well, we've done the work to do exactly the same thing when it comes to thinking about rotational forms of work and energy as well. Um, so let's, let's see that in action. Uh, so for instance, we've talked already uh, a few times now about the kinetic energy an object has. And if I think about the kinetic energy due to translation, so I'll write k with a subscript t, we saw that that was 1 half times mass times the velocity squared. So if the center of mass of an object was moving at some velocity, the kinetic energy of that object was 1 half times the mass times the velocity squared. Okay? Well, rotational motion, the equation, is going to look just the same. Uh, the kinetic energy due to rotations is 1 half times whatever the angular version of mass is, and we saw that we use this letter i to stand for angular mass. And we want a velocity squared. Well, you know, we have a symbol for the angular velocity. So this is exactly the right expression to write how much rotational kinetic energy does an object have. Now, the total kinetic energy uh, that an object has, so like k total, is just given by the sum of however much translational kinetic energy it has plus however much rotational kinetic energy it has. So for instance, um, suppose you're riding a bicycle, right? So you and your bicycle are moving at some velocity, and the wheels of your bicycle are spinning around, okay? So your total kinetic energy is your translational part, and that's going to be 1 half times the total mass, like mass of the bike, 
plus the mass of the person times the velocity squared plus any rotational kinetic energy this system has. And in this case, you know, the wheels are spinning, and that means that the wheels have rotational kinetic energy. So then this is going to be plus one half times, well, the only thing spinning are the wheels, so that's just going to be the angular mass of both wheels times how fast those wheels are rotating, times the angular velocity squared. Okay, so when you're doing work to get your bicycle moving, you actually have to do work to build up both of these kinetic energies. You do work to add to your translational and the wheel's rotational kinetic energies. Okay, so speaking of work, um, speaking of work, we saw that for translational motions, when there are forces involved, we had this expression work was equal to the vector force dotted into the displacement. So if you applied a force over a distance, like you were pushing something up a ramp, um, the force you applied times the distance over which you applied it gave you how much work you, you did. Well, translational work uh, is this, so maybe I'll write a little t here. Uh, rotational work, again, we've chosen you know, to define everything so that these expressions will all look the same. Here we had a force times a distance. Uh, the angular equivalent of a force is a torque, and the angular equivalent of a distance is how much have we rotated and in what direction. So just like exerting a force over distance does work, exerting a torque through a rotation does work. And just like in this case, if you're exerting a force on an object that isn't moving, you're not doing work on that object. Here, if you're exerting a torque on an object that isn't rotating, you're not doing work on that object. Now, uh, a new concept that I'll introduce at this point, although we could have talked about it in the case of translation, is the idea of power. Right? So power uh, is a physical quantity, is a physical quantity uh, that describes that describes um, work done in a certain amount of time, in a certain amount of time, right? So in an, as an equation, we might say power is equal to work divided by time, right? And, you know, this work could be work from applying a force over a distance or applying a torque over uh, an angle, so on and so forth. Uh, let's get the units and dimensions of this object uh, down. Uh, well, the dimensions of power are apparently the dimensions of energy divided by one more dimension of time. Uh, and the SI unit of power, of power, uh, is the joule second, joules per second, right? Which we might write joules per second. Um, and this combination is also known as, uh, AKA, uh, the watt, uh, which has the symbol W. So one watt is equal to one joule per second. Um, Let's, uh, just because power is kind of typically expressed in these somewhat unfamiliar units, uh, let's just get some kind of order of magnitude senses for, you know, what is a watt in the first place. You know, you've probably seen watts as like a measure of something to do with your light bulbs or your appliances, um, but like intuitively, what is it like? Uh, so here are some order of magnitude examples. Um, let's say a liter of water, a liter of water, which is basically the same as a quart, at least to this kind of order of magnitude that I'm talking about, weighs about one kilogram, right? It weighs about 2.2 .2 pounds. Um, and that means that the weight of one liter of water um, is about 10 newtons. So it has a weight of, remember, mass times the acceleration due to gravity. So one kilogram times about 9.8 meters per second squared. That's about 10 newtons, give or take. Um, so a joule, remember, which is uh, doing uh, a force of one newton over one meter, that's like, uh, so then one joule is like lifting a liter of water, lifting one liter of water uh, about 10 centimeters in the air. Right, so one joule is the work that you do, you know, taking a liter of water and lifting it up 10 centimeters or four inches, give or take. Okay, so that's kind of the scale of what one joule is. Um, great. Uh, sometimes people use uh, old imperial units for power. Uh, so another unit of power 
uh, of power is one horsepower. And, you know, especially, I guess, if you're into cars, you might have seen powers of engines described at, in terms of horsepower. Um, one horsepower, uh, that's defined to be, they've kind of standardized what one horse is, I suppose, uh, 745.7 watts. Okay, so uh, I looked up a random car because I'm not really a car person, so I had to look things up. Suppose you own, I wrote down the name of a sports car, suppose you own a Ferrari, Ferrari, is there two R's in Ferrari or one? I don't remember. Uh, F8 Spider. That sounds like a funny car. Uh, a Ferrari F8 Spider has an engine. Has an engine uh, with a maximum output that can output. Uh, I looked this up. 710 horsepower, and that's equivalent to uh, 530,000 watts, which certainly sounds like a lot. How a lot is that? Um, you know, uh, the weight, <laughs> let's say the mass of this car, uh, which I also looked up, is about uh, 1,400 kilograms. 1,400 kilograms. So if I imagine, let me just make that actually look like a zero. Uh, so if I imagine that I'm adding in my own weight because I'm sitting in this car too, and maybe I've packed some luggage or something, uh, let's just make this a slightly more round number and say that it's got a weight of you know, vaguely 15,000 uh, newtons. So this number plus 50 or 100 kilograms, again, times 9.8 meters per second squared to go from mass to weight. Um, so comparing these things, uh, apparently that means that uh, the car's engine has enough power, uh, power to lift, uh, to lift, uh, its own mass plus its passengers, it and its passengers, uh, dividing these numbers 35 meters up in the air every second. Every second. Uh, so I guess it's no wonder that it's easy for sports cars to go up steep hills um, because this is actually really kind of quite a large gain in elevation to go through in one second uh, if you're just driving up a hill. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, okay, so in this section, again, we kind of reviewed friction, the way that it works on surfaces trying to slide past each other. Friction uh, can be both static, so the forces that resist relative motion before the surfaces start sliding, and then also dynamic, once they've started sliding. We know the direction friction points. It's always to oppose this relative motion. We detailed kind of what it depends on, although we didn't write down any equations for now. Uh, and then we talked about wheels are basically working by um, going over the ground in such a way that they always experience static friction, but never have to deal with sliding friction. And since they never have to deal with sliding friction, they don't have to worry about losing energy to frictional heating or to thermal, uh, thermal energy. And then we just kind of continued our uh, our exploration of the fact that a lot of the formulas we wrote down for like energy and work associated with translational motion have completely equivalent forms when it comes to uh, rotational motion. So that's, uh, that's quite nice. So the kinetic energy formulas look the same, the work formulas look the same, and then we could have introduced power at any moment. Uh, we waited until this point to do it. And power is something that has typical units of joules uh, per second, which is equivalent to a watt. And we tried to get a little sense of like, what is one watt in the first place?